Here's a Cecil and I degree professor of atmospheric science at MIT. Uh, we've been on the faculty since 1981. I just learned in 1981 he chose MIT over Chicago. Uh, when he moved uh, to UCLA, he seems to have done fine despite that very unwise choice. Uh, his research focused on uh, tropical meteorology and climate with a specialization in hurricane physics. I think widely considered the world's expert on hurricane physics. His research also includes cumulus convection and advanced methods of sampling uh, the atmosphere in the native uh, numerical weather prediction. The co-author or author of more than 100 peer-reviewed papers, two books, Divine Wind, the Extreme Science of Hurricanes, uh, and what we know about climate change. Uh, he's also a co-director of MIT's Loring Center, a climate think tank uh, devoted to basic curiosity driven climate research. Okay, and I can guarantee this will be an entertaining presentation. So, welcome here. Thank you, Michael. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me here. It's always a great pleasure to come visit this university and such an interesting group of people doing wonderful work here. Uh, Michael set a very high bar for me. I don't know if I'll live up to that, but I'll, I'll try. So my uh, group at MIT has done work in tropical meteorology and hurricanes for some years. And in recent years, we've tried to um, capitalize, if you will, on this work to see if we can understand how to use the physics of hurricanes to better assess the, the risk that they pose to us now economically and in other terms, and also how that risk may evolve as, as the climate changes. And that's what I want to talk with you about today, is how you go about assessing risk in a place where history, in some sense, is too short to allow you to accumulate purely historical statistics to do this. So the program is to uh, start off with a very brief uh, overview of hurricanes so that we're on the same page and uh, to talk a little bit about how what hurricanes have been like in the past, how they might be affected by climate change, and the meat of the talk will be how to go about assessing <coughs> risk. So this is uh, interesting, kind of a new venture for me and my group is to get into the whole uh, science of risk assessment. So just again, so that we're all on the same page, everyone seen a pretty picture of tropical cyclones from space. Here is one that's been doctored up by the folks with uh, lots of money to spend on this sort of thing down at NASA. And this shows a particular hurricane called Floyd uh, here approaching, uh, if you look in the upper left, you can see the peninsula of Florida there, ultimately going up into North Carolina and doing a lot of damage, mostly through freshwater floods. When you look down from space, you see the swirling mass of clouds a few hundred kilometers across. The heaviest rain and the strongest winds are in an annulus. Uh, that whose inner dimension may be around 20 or 40 kilometers and whose outer uh, dimension may be from 30 to 60 kilometers. And that annulus often surrounds a clear region that we call the eye of the hurricane. And here is a closer picture. This is from one of the, I think it's from the International Space Station, this one of a Hurricane Igor in 2010. So you're looking down. This is this annulus, which we call the eye wall. And it's because if you're inside of it, you see a circular wall of clouds. It is under this wall or annulus that the strongest winds occur. In the middle of the storm, it's, it's fairly calm. And um, these storms form over tropical oceans, but frequently curve into middle and high latitudes. This is just a map of the tracks of tropical cyclones globally from 1945 to 2006, color coded by their intensity, so the reds are when they uh, have stronger winds. And uh, you can see this belt, for example, here in the Atlantic, uh, forming anywhere from off of Africa into the Gulf of Mexico, traveling westward, curving up to the northeast, sometimes influencing the Gulf and east coast of the U.S., the Canadian Maritimes, and so forth, and of course, Central America. Um, these are the sto yeah. Sorry? So sorry, ah, this, this, is, it, this is an interesting thing. This is the first question people ask, is why not the South Atlantic? And it's a really interesting question. The short, direct answer is the thermodynamic potential for hurricanes is very low in the South Atlantic. 
But then you ask, why is that so? And it's an interesting fact about the world oceans, that the ocean's heat transport in both the South and, and the North Atlantic is toward the North. So a lot of the heat uh, that would be accumulating in the South Atlantic Ocean is being transported to the North Atlantic. And so the North Atlantic is systematically warmer. Now then you could ask, why is this so, right? And that, that gets to be a very involved question. But the proximate reason is it's not warm enough in the South Atlantic. Yeah. You mean down here? Yeah. yeah. So these are rotating storms, <clears throat> and um, they are rotating by virtue of the fact that they're on a rotating planet. And f for you to have a rotating storm that lasts for more than a few hours, you have to be able to take the Earth's rotation axis, which is pointing toward the north, and project it onto what you call up and get an answer that's appreciably different from zero. Well, right on the equator, your perpendicular up is perpendicular to the Earth's rotation. There's no rotation about a vertical axis. We call that zero Coriolis, where you can't have vortices. So in practice, it turns out it's almost a threshold thing. When you get to about five degrees latitude in either hemisphere, you can have hurricanes. This is very useful information. If you, uh, uh, one of your retirement projects is to buy a sailboat and sail it around the world, as I sometimes fantasize, and you're afraid of these storms, well, you just stick to the equator and you'll be fine. Of course, you may have other problems, like land masses, for example. But uh, anyway, um, I wanted to also point out that although we mostly hear about Atlantic storms, they only constitute about 11% of the total. Most of the uh, storms, which we generically call tropical cyclones, by the way, hurricanes is a strictly regional name, occur in the Indian and uh, Pacific Oceans, not in the Atlantic. They are creatures of the summer and early fall. This is just the number of storms per month in the northern and southern hemispheres. You can see that there are more storms in the northern hemisphere for that same reason, Michael, that we have this heat transport systematically biased toward the north. And um, the axis for the northern hemisphere is this top one and for the southern hemisphere, the bottom one. So you can see in both hemispheres, they occur in the summer and early fall. I could tell you a lot of interesting things about the physics of these storms. I've chosen not to do that this time, skip over that to get down to the meat of the topic, which is the risks that they pose and how to deal with them. Um, the most obvious sort of associated phenomenon that we usually think about when we think about the risk is the wind itself. Right? The wind can be very destructive when it's blowing at sufficient velocity. Everybody knows that. It tends to be in nature a bit of a threshold phenomenon. A lot of our structures are built to take winds up to a certain wind speed that we commonly experience. And if you go much beyond that, things start to go downhill rapidly. Hurricane Andrew in Florida in 1992, then the most expensive insured disaster in the United States was almost entirely a wind event. Most of the damage was done directly by wind in that case. But um, usually the most destructive uh, aspect of the hurricane is a storm surge. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what a storm surge is because many people find it difficult to picture it. But it is a, a rising, of a local rising of the sea level, generally speaking, accompanying the passage of the center of the storm, which as happened in Katrina and fame more recently in Sandy, does a lot of flooding. Uh, flooding damage in the United States is handled financially in a very different way from wind damage. Wind damage is privately insured. Flooding damage, whether from a storm surge or other means, is, is usually publicly insured. So economically in the US, they're quite different. But flooding from fresh water, from rain, is another very serious uh, source of damage, not necessarily from storms that are strong in other respects uh, sometimes. So to take an example, Hurricane Mitch, which is the second most lethal uh, disaster to, on record in the Western Hemisphere in 1998, killed somewhere north of 12,000 people in Central America entirely from freshwater floods due to heavy rain. The wind played no role at all in that storm. So we have those risks. Now to return briefly to the surge, this is a rather horrid picture of the uh, tsunami that struck Japan a few years ago. Um, and you've seen pictures like this. 
The reason I'm putting it up here is a tsunami is hydrodynamically identical to a storm surge. The only difference between them is what, what set them off. In the case of a tsunami, it's an earthquake. In the case of a storm surge, it's the wind. But once triggered, hydrodynamically, they behave very, very similar. They obey basically the same equations. For those of you in the room with some fluids background, sort of shallow water equations. And so if you want to picture a storm surge, that is what you should have in your mind, except that it occurs in the middle of a typhoon or a hurricane, all right? And that's why it's so lethal. And people sometimes think of it as a big wave. It isn't. It's just this elevation of the sea that leads to this kind of uh, flooding. And uh, I don't need to tell you how destructive that can be. So um, those are the risks that we wish to get some better handle on. How, how uh, you know, in a particular place, what are the risks of these different associated phenomena? And are they likely to change as the climate changes? So here are a few, uh, I call them basic hurricane economics, the statistics of these. Here's something to start out with. This is from the year 2006, and it's statistics compiled by Munich Reinsurance, one of the big giant reinsurance companies in the world. And it is the, uh, a pie chart showing insured losses for that year by the type of phenomenon. And so 79% of that is windstorms, and most, most of that turns out to be hurricanes. 2% um, earthquakes, uh, tsunamis, volcanoes, 14% uh, flood. Now that is not a representation of how much damage these events do proportionally, just the insured part of that. And the real story of that is that for interesting historical reasons, in most parts of the world, wind damage is privately insured. Of course, there are places where even that isn't privately insured. Flooding damage, which is much larger, actually, and earthquake damage, which is comparable, okay, globally, is not usually privately insured. Well, it's certainly true in the United States if any of you have tried to buy insurance. You can get private earthquake insurance, but it's very, very expensive. Okay, so insurance companies are very interested in hurricanes, right? Obviously. This is, uh, for the United States, 1980 to 2012, a different kind of statistic. It is an estimate made by NOAA, and I don't really know how they did it, to be honest with you, of the uh, percentage of monetary damage, whether or not it's insured, okay? And divided by phenomena. So you see that tropical cyclones are about half of it already, okay? And then droughts and heat waves, which cause enormous damage, usually agriculturally, are the green slice. Severe local storms, which include tornadoes, which you have around here, are the yellow slice. And, then floods that are not associated with tropical cyclones or this orange slice and so on, okay? So that gives you some rough idea of the importance of these things economically. Um, there are big upward trends all around the world in natural hazard damages. And I'll explain what I mean by that. This is the United States hurricane damage by decade in 10 to the 10th, $2,004 from the first decade of the 20th century to the most recent decade, although the statistics actually stopped in the year 2006, so it doesn't include all of that decade. And um, you can see the steadily mounting damages, correcting for just inflation, nothing else. But that is almost entirely driven by population and GDP growth and so forth. So this is this is a very rough proxy for the population in hurricane-prone regions. It's just the population of the state of Florida from 1790 to 2004. And while well, you can see what happens, the orange part's a projection. You know, back in 1800 or so, there might have been three people living in the state, something like that. Some more moved in. Um, a big kink in the curve around 1950. Does anybody want to ask what technical development caused that kink? Air conditioning. It became possible for a mere mortal to live in that state <laughs> after the invention of the air conditioner. So the population shot up. And um, my colleague, Roger Pilkey Jr. at Colorado, has attempted to go back 
And I have a lot of reservations about this, but attempted to go back and said, well, what if the same storms that occurred in 1925, say, occurred now? How much damage would they do? And I was trying to correct for changes in GDP and infrastructure, quite apart from inflation. There you don't see much of a trend, although the decade from 2000 to 2010 really still stands up. Sorry? This is all mediated by you know, how much economic activity, yeah. maybe who bought insurance. That's, it's not very sophisticated, to be honest with you. Yeah. There's no purely physical time series measure? Well, the problem is that we have done a lousy job measuring hurricanes uh, before about 1970. Okay, and that's why we can't do that. You know, even when we have landfalling events, we know what damage they did, but we don't know how fast the wind was blowing. Typically, these storms took out whatever instrumentation was around anyway. So that's why we turn to the economists, because we don't actually have very good data ourselves. Recently, we do, but not. Now, one of the reservations, I mean, this 1920s decade, for example, is dominated by just two events. Well, so yeah. Well, by GDP. It's very, very crude. Yeah. yeah, that's right. We had damage estimates from that error. Okay, and it's a question of correcting those too. But to give you some of the pitfalls, this is the 1926 Miami hurricane and the 1928 Okeechobee hurricane, both damaging events. Both together sending arguably the state of Florida into a serious depression shortly before the rest of the country followed suit. And uh, it's likely that for that reason that shortly before that depression, particularly in Florida, land values were overvalued. And so this might be a overestimate. Anyway, this is very dicey, okay. But you can see that people have tried, and not me, of course, because I don't have the expertise, tried to make these corrections. Yeah. Uh, was the sort of insurance coverage for the equivalent back in the 20s? No, not at all. In terms of how many, what proportion of structures were insured? I couldn't tell you the exact numbers, but nothing like today. Uh, now this is uh, taking that adjusted damage and classifying it by the intensity of the storm at landfall, relying on these dicey meteorological records that do exist by something called the Saffir-Simpson category. It's basically a ranking of how strong the storm was by wind speed. And you can see that the bulk of the damage is done by category three, four, and five storms, not so much by category one and two storms, but this is just the number of events ranked the same way. The number of events is entirely dominated by these low category storms. And there's a very important lesson here, which I think is the most, the first thing I say to anybody interested in the economics of hurricanes is don't pay any attention to the frequency of hurricanes. It really, the first order doesn't matter because our developed civilization anyway, is pretty well adapted to these low intensity events. They don't cause a lot of damage, even though, and because they're so numerous, we're adapted to them. It's these events, of which there have only been three category five storms in our whole history at landfall, okay? Category five at landfall. They're not that many, fours aren't very many either, but they dominate the damage, okay? And that's a really important fact. So when we're interested in hurricanes and how they might change, in practice we should be interested in the relatively small number of relatively intense storms. And I will return to this point. Okay. Yeah. 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 I, I think the two questions are difficult to separate, but I would put it the first way, right? If we had Cat 5 typhoons every year, we would be adapted to them, okay? Maybe we'd do what the Mayans did and just not build cities on the coast. That's what, how they adapted. Um, all right, so if we want to do something a little bit more quantitative by assessing the risk, I mean, supposing you're an insurance company and you wanna know what is the hurricane risk in Boston or Miami or someplace, how are you gonna do it? Well, here's what you're up against. So just looking at what I've just showed you, more than half of this normalized damage has been caused by just eight events in our history. That is, if you believe these normalizations, whether it's eight or nine or 10 or three or four, 
it's a bit beside the point. It's a very small number. How much statistics are you going to do with eight? Well, you have to be a much better statistician than I am anyway, all right? Um, more than 90% of all the damage has been caused by storms of category three, four, and five, even though they constitute only 13% of the total. So, you know, reporters ask me all the time, you know, what's going to happen to the frequency and intensity of hurricanes? It's, it's not quite the right question to ask, right? You really want to know what's going to happen to the frequency of the high-end storms. That's the better way to put it, okay? Um, I've been campaigning again, uh, to NOAA against them issuing seasonal hurricane forecasts. They just came out with one for this year. Not because they aren't any good at it. As a matter of fact, they aren't very good at it. That's another complaint. But it is forecasting something that's not meaningful to most people unless you ha are a member of a betting pool. You don't really care how many storms occur in the Atlantic Ocean. It's irrelevant. 2012, I think, is we had lots and lots and lots of hurricanes in the Atlantic. Not one of them made landfall anywhere. Okay. Uh, that's not what you want to know. In fact, what you want to know can't be forecast today in, a, in any sensible way on a seasonal basis. So the bottom line is we really can't use statistics of landfalls to make an, a sensible assessment of risk. Right? They're just too few events. It's particularly true in a place like New England, you know, which has a serious, very damaging event on average once every 150 years. And you can bet we're not adapted to that. Right? So this is just another way of, this is a, uh, a tally of many American uh, Gulf Coast and East Coast uh, cities where we've put them on a chart in which an objectively estimated return period, and I'll come back to how that was objectively measured, is on this axis versus the number of years that have actually passed since that city experienced a major hurricane, major being cat three or higher, okay? And the interesting thing about that, if you look at this chart, by the way, this is where the two numbers are equal. This, this dashed line is the median, that is, if this return period is right, then in principle half the point should lie above half below, um, is this uh, clustering here. If you look at this, most of these cities are in northeastern Florida. It so happens that northeastern Florida hasn't had a major hurricane in much longer than would be the case if you had a very large sample and measured its average return period. Well within the statistics, though, of what you expect given the overall low number of events. So one of the things that emergency planners and city planners are interested, well, these guys just don't have a recent experience of a major hurricane, but they are liable for it. They're much more susceptible than they think they are, simply looking at a longer term record or other bases for estimating the risk. How do you deal with this? And that's what I'm really here to talk about it. My, my basic pitch to, to you is that you don't just rely on statistics. There are other ways of knowing about the world than looking at statistics. You can bring physics to bear on the problem. Physics coupled with statistics, I should say. That's what I really want to talk to you about. So what are we going to do? Well, I'd say that there are two approaches. One in which really is extending a purely statistical approach is this new field which we call paleotempestology. Can we extend the record back by looking for geological evidence for hurricanes. And this is a new endeavor, comparatively new. I'm not a practitioner, but I'm a promoter of this and I work with some students on it. So one of the things that happens when you have a hurricane, typically in many tropical coastal regions, the ocean is separated from back uh, shore lagoons and marshes by sand or sandy beach. Um, you have lots of inland waterways, inland lagoons, marshes, sinkholes, and things like that. And when a big hurricane comes along, the storm surge washes some of the sand into these marshes and lagoon, which normally just have a steady rate of organic deposition of mud. So what you do is you take a rubber, flimsy rubber dinghy and you load it with graduate students and you give them a coring device and send them out into the lagoon and they take a nice core and in that core you see a lot of mud with interspersed sand layers. Well, you can radiocarbon date the mud and find out when the storm surges occur. Now you have to be careful because a tsunami, a real tsunami from an earthquake will cause the same signature exactly. 
So you have to work out which are tsunamis and which are hurricanes and so forth. There's a lot into it. There's not, this is not the only method. It's one of several that have been developed. So an example here is looking at sediment deposits in a sinkhole in far northwestern Florida up here by Appalachie Bay. And this is a record going back 4,000 years. Okay, here. This shows the fraction of um, the sand in the sinkholes that was made of, of coarse grain material that had to have been washed in from the Gulf. And so this is 2000 BC to 2000 AD, if you like. And you can see that there are periods in this record, like here, and especially back between about 1000 and 0 BC, where in general there was elevated activity compared to today. All right, so according to the paleotempestology, uh, the risk of hurricanes in northwestern Florida has been much larger at various times in the past than it is today. There are other places where it's reversed, by the way, from that. Well, this is sort of useful to know. Is this risk likely to, to change on that time scale? Excuse me. Yes. How geologically unstable is the area in the, in the, in the Caribbean that you would have an earthquake and a tsunami? So this is a problem, right? Because there are um, uh, active plates, uh, plate dynamics going on in the Caribbean region. There are big earthquakes in places like Mexico and so forth. So there's a tsunami risk. And the way you deal with that is you try to look not just at one place, but supposing you had a sinkhole in Texas, all right? it's very unlikely that a hurricane would cause at the same time a big storm surge in Texas as in Florida. But it's very likely that an earthquake in the Caribbean would cause such a thing. So you try to do the spatial correlation. So Terry, if you look across yeah. all the records in that area, do they average out or is there a net elevated or reduced risk today versus the past? Or the too small? Well, it turns out to be regional. So what we really see is a shifting of hurricane risk from west to east. So it looks like New England is at more at risk than it was a thousand years ago. Uh, the Carolinas are more at risk, but the Gulf region less so. But not enough work has been done to be very confident of that statement. So what I, my contribution to this is to try to, to do it by physics and the brute force way to do that is by direct numerical simulation of hurricanes. So the problem with that is if you want to do that in a way that you can simulate a large set of hurricanes globally, you have a big practical problem that at least right at the moment seems insurmountable. It's just a computational problem. The heart of it is that to resolve a hurricane computationally, the, the important thing to resolve is this eye wall. And what we know from detailed experiments with really finely resolved regional models is you have to have a computational grid whose lattice points are on the order of a couple kilometers apart. To get much more than that, you start to have real problems with the simulation, all right? You're gonna do this globally at one kilometer? Not today, not for long enough to get a reasonable sample of storms. So it's pure computational firepower. So the storm itself goes out to, you know, order 1,000 kilometers of circulation, and you want to do this globally, or at least on a large regional basis, can't be done. Yeah, you can run models that fine. You can even do it globally for a few months. It's been done in Japan, but not for 100 years. Um, and in today's climate models, the computational nodes are typically spaced order 100 kilometers. And they try to produce tropical cyclones, but they're very, very, very poorly resolved. And I'll show you what that really means in practice. So here we have a frequency distribution of hurricanes in nature. This happens to be for the Eastern Pacific Ocean, but it's similar in other ocean basins by their peak, lifetime peak wind speed in meters per second, going from 10 to 90. So the observed distribution is this black line, lots of weak storms, a few very intense ones. And this solid line you see here is the demarcation, artificial demarcation between a category two and category three hurricane. So the damaging storms to a first approximation are right of that line. This is an attempt to simulate hurricanes with a global model with unusually fine resolution for a global model, 50 kilometers. 
and uh, they just don't get the damaging storms. Okay, they just don't get them. Period. So you're sort of out of luck. And what we have tried to do, well, let me just sort of point out. This is, is there yeah. It is. And to the problem, the specific problem is that the number of spatial scales yeah. that are required to do it is too large for the computational firepower we have. And I don't know how to answer your question about whether that. I mean, can't yeah. you give me the wrong example? Yeah. That are, are computationally limited? Yeah, I mean, sort of fusion, plasma fusion physics, I think they feel computationally limited. Historically, it's been particle physics. Um, meteorology or climate and defense that, that have been the big demands for supercomputers, only recently supplanted by video games, I think, but, or something like that. Astrophysics. Yeah. yeah, astrophysics as well, absolutely. Question? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. To so that one? Yeah. Um, whether or not it ends up being a really severe event or not, mm. uh, the one kilometer resolution of physics in the origin of the storm happening at a very fine scale. Right? Okay. So I'm curious as to why it would predict if, if, if the multi scale requirement is for, uh, you know, for the events period rather than severity, why you would be even coarsely better predicting the lower severity than the higher. Why, why didn't, I'm sorry. Why would you even sort of roughly be doing a better job of predicting the lower intensity ones than the higher? I don't think you necessarily are. If you went to 100 kilometers, that, that red curve wouldn't be terribly different, if that's what you mean. They didn't go to 50 kilometers specifically to do hurricanes. They did it for other reasons, yeah. It sort of tanks 50 kilometers, right? It tanks. That's wind speed. Sorry, this is wind speed, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you are, right. And if you could map one distribution on the other uniformly, you'd be okay, right? If you could map that red distribution onto the black one and be correct for all climates, then you'd have it made. Unfortunately, you can't. Yeah. Ah, because you need to get the physics at this very fine scale, right, to get the wind speed right. right. Yeah, yeah. Why, why don't you get the physics right even for a lower wind speed? Because you get the yeah. wrong for all values of the wind speed. Okay, then why, yeah. why do you appear to be doing some lower wind speed? Yeah, um, I know the answer to this question. I'm not sure I know how to get it across in a digestible way, all right? It's, there's some process called phonogenesis that's really responsible for the spike in wind in the eye wall. You just can't plain resolve it though. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip over this, but so how are we going to deal with this um, computational problem? So I would say that there are two choices. I call this the brute force and obstinacy choice, right? You just fill a warehouse full of supercomputers and you have a go at it, okay? You just Throw everything you've got at it. That's option one. And as you probably can tell from the way I've been talking about it, it's not an option I'm particularly fond of. But people are working on this. And option two, I would call applied math and modest resources. By modest resources, I mean something like that. And I'm not really <laughs> kidding either. Um, theory, you know, pencil and paper or maybe a laptop computer you can bring to the beach. All right, so I'm actually going to ask and pose the question and try to answer it, that you can actually get very far with these resources, all right, without having to throw a supercomputer at the problem. Now, not all of my colleagues agree, but I think you can, and I'm gonna show you evidence that you can. All right. So what have we done? We have, this is the only sort of really technical part, and this might be a little bit more for the geophysicists, but. Uh, years ago, we built as a teaching laboratory exercise a, a really stripped down tropical cyclone model. And its particular virtue is that it, rather than, I mean, it assumes circular symmetry, which a lot of models do in this arena, is rather than using physical radius as the independent variable in the model, 
we use the actual absolute angular momentum about the axis of the storm or quantity given by this. So this is distance from the center times the swirling wind speed plus uh, basically this is the projection of the angular velocity of the Earth's rotation onto the local vertical times the radius squared. It's conserved following samples of fluid as they move along if they're not acted on by some kind of frictional torque. This becomes, we phrase the differential equations with this rather than radius as the independent coordinate. And that has huge advantages. A lot of the nonlinearity of the equations is absorbed into that coordinate transformation. The equations are a lot less nonlinear. Nonlinear is there, but it's in the coordinate transformation. And more to the point, these surfaces get very close together in the eye wall. If you look at them in physical space, angular momentum surfaces get compressed in the eye wall. Okay. And the more intense the storm, the more that's true. So very naturally, without having to do anything computational, you've done this at the stage of writing the partial differential equations, you get much better resolution where you need it at the sacrifice of resolution where you don't need it. All right, and the equations themselves tell you that. So this is an angular momentum surface model, and it was very cheap. We could run, students could run it on their laptops. Even 20 years ago, they could do that. Uh, or desktops back then. And uh, that was that, and it was very nice. And I put these other features for the technical people in the audience, but you don't need to worry about that. And then um, one year, um, a student in the class said, well, have you ever tried to use this to forecast a real hurricane? And I laughed and said, no, this is a toy. It's not supposed to be a thing. And then I went home and thought about it and said, well, maybe if you gave it the you know, real boundary conditions and you did this and that. And uh, we tried it and to our amazement, it seemed to do a pretty good job forecasting the intensity of real hurricanes to the point where today organizations like the US Navy uh, Joint Typhoon Warning Center use this little toy model as part of their suite of tools in actually making real forecasts for US naval fleets at sea, okay? So just to grind that in. This is, um, we have been running forecasts automatically and routinely now for well over a decade. And this is our sort of scores for the last season in the North Atlantic. We do this globally, but I'm showing you the North Atlantic here. This is a measure of the intensity error. So, so bigger is badder, okay? You don't want to be having anything like errors. It's a function of what we call the forecast lead time. So this is a 12 hour forecast out to 72 hour forecast here by a number of different products. So the dark blue bar at the left is the official subjective forecast made at the National Hurricane Center, uh, but with guidance provided by a lot of other tools. The state of the art model, or the US government has poured millions into and in which you have to call the power company before you run is the last bar on the right, this red bar. And this little toy model is the sort of medium blue bar that I've highlighted with the arrows here. So you can see that particularly at the longer lead times, it's among the best, in fact, it is the best guidance product in this case, all right? It beats out the big supercomputer models. Consensus. It's, it's, it's the same philosophy as crowdsourcing. You take an average of all, just even a naive average of all these models, you get a better result. And then the forecasters have experience. So none of these are parallel Well, the, no, these are actually, uh, well, that's a good question. The green curve is a statistical model. It knows about the environment and it knows about past environments and past storms. It's called D-SHIP. So is this orange bar, is a less sophisticated statistical. The other ones, CHIPS is my model. This is a big model run at Princeton, and then this is a state-of-the-art deterministic numerical model. So the Hurricane Center is wise to use everything it has, and it is a kind of a crowdsourcing problem. It's, it's a curious thing that even if you add a relatively poor model, into a consensus, it often improves the consensus. It's a very, very interesting thing of its own right. Forecasting is maybe one of, maybe the only thing I know that is objectively done better by committee than by individual, <laughs> okay? <laughs> At least weather forecasting. So the next question is, can we use this simple model to do, 
to help with the hurricane risk assessment problem. So we invented this approach, and it was done kind of on the fly, and we didn't know whether it would work. And it involves using this model, but it involves using a lot of other information as well. So what we do is we take the output of, a, say, a climate model, or a re, what we call a reanalysis data set, which is a gridded realization of the current climate. And we take some key statistical properties of that model, the thermodynamics of the model state, um, the statistics of wind fields, and um, we use that in this approach, the first step of which is to take this time-evolving, large-scale, coarse-grain state that may or may not have hurricanes and it's irrelevant, and um, throw into it some we actually randomly seed it. So you can imagine going down, I like to say, to the greenhouse shop and buying a package of hurricane seeds and just randomly throwing it into this evolving climate state. So it's random in space and time. All right. Now, the easy part is to ask, well, where will these seeds travel? And that's because hurricanes, these very isolated vortices, tend to first order just to move with a large-scale flow in which they're embedded. Well, that's the flow we're giving this the large scale from the climate model or the reanalysis data set. So they move with this large scale flow. We have to make a correction for something called beta drift, for those of you who know what that is. Um, and then we run this intensity model, this thing that started out as a laboratory exercise, along each of these tracks to predict its intensity evolution. Now, when you do that, something like 98% of those proto hurricanes just die because you put them in places that weren't conducive to hurricanes. And so it, it basically capitalizes on the broad idea of, of natural selection. You know, only the fittest, to be a little bit more precise, only those seeds that you put down into the good environments survive. But because it's so cheap to do this, you can afford that 2% success rate. And you regard the survivors as constituting the climatology of hurricanes for that climate state, that coarse grain climate state. All right? It's, it's an angular momentum coordinates, but it, it's, a, it's also a thermodynamic model. And the, the main, there are two main thermodynamic parameters that drive it. One is something called the potential intensity which comes from the sort of heat engine mathematics of that. And the other is a measure of how dry the middle troposphere is. And all of that was tested, rigor tested as far as we could statistically in the forecasting environment. And it's only because we saw it worked well in the forecasting that we had some confidence that it would work well in this as well. So yeah. Is Sorry? Oh yeah, yeah. Now I'll show it to you. It's a, it really, it, oddly enough, when you write the differential equations in this coordinate, the equations themselves are much more elegant and simple. Okay, so we're not doing a computational fine mesh. We're transforming the equations themselves. It used to be done very commonly. It's the heart of, say, semi-geostrophic theory. Okay, so we can afford to create event sets of hundreds of thousands of events very fast and cheaply this way. And the question is, is it any good, all right? The random seeding was itself a random shot in the dark. Um, most hurricanes develop from very well-defined pre-existing disturbances, which this method entirely ignores. So to be honest with you, we didn't think it would work. And in the meantime, we subjected it to a lot of tests against historical data, which by the way, is the only place where historical hurricane data enters this method is in seeing whether the method's any good. It doesn't, the method itself doesn't make use of any historical hurricane data in its actual. So, I mean, here are just some eyeball things. Obviously, you want to do much more than this, but here is a set of points of randomly seeded storms that turned out to survive. And here is, uh, and this was designed to have the same number as a particular observational data set. These are points at which storms were observed to form. And you can see similarities and you can see differences. Um, there's a well-known hurricane hole in the Caribbean where not that many storms form and that you see in both data sets. But you see that there are points 
at high latitudes in observations that we don't have. And so you might say, well, we're simply not succeeding there. But then you look a little bit more carefully and you say, what? what? A, a hurricane generated off the tip of Long Island? And you start saying, well, we know that doesn't happen. Storms don't form off of, hurricanes don't form off of Long Island. And they can get there once they're formed. They don't form there. And this illustrates that there are a lot of imperfections in the observational data. These guys were picked off by either a, an uneducated human analyst or an algorithm. And they were really winter storms or storms that had nothing to do with tropical storms that got into this database. So when you do this sort of comparison, you're, you have this double problem that you're comparing two fictions with each other and you have to decide you know, how to deal with that. Now this is just a random set of a thousand downscale tracks, not from a climate model, but from what's something called a reanalysis data set, color coded by wind speed. Yes, there is a storm in the South Atlantic there, Michael, one or two. And there was one in nature, although it didn't make that particular graphic that I showed you. There's one called Katerina in 2006, I think it was, that affected Brazil. So every once in a blue moon, something happens in the South Atlantic. But the real virtue of this is that it gets the whole probability distribution of intensities. So the blue curves are uh, from historical hurricane observations showing the number of events whose lifetime maximum wind speed exceeded the value on the x-axis. And the red is from a, a little bit larger set of synthetic tracks, actually a somewhat larger, 211 historical tracks versus 1,755 synthetic tracks. And then the error bars or the confidence limits are just subsampling the synthetic tracks at the rate of the historical tracks and asking, you know, where do 90% of the subsamples lie in that? So you get some feeling for that. And it does a really good job on the intensity. I didn't understand yeah. the seeding part. How okay. Did you, yeah, how did you choose a number to see? Ah, so there is one, I'm glad you asked that because it's an opportune thing. You're choosing a rate of seeding. And it's an arbitrary number, it's one number globally. And we calibrate that to get the right number of hurricanes globally from 1980 to 2012 using historical. So there's a calibration, a one-time, one-number calibration. Yeah. So in the advantage of this is you can take a place like New England, and you estimate return periods of storms at landfall whose wind speed is given by here. This is a log scale, of course. The green is an estimate from historical data stopping where you sort of run out of historical data and the blue points are from a not very impressive very large set of synthetic tracks. Never mind the red curve, it's just a, a curve fit using extreme value theory. But you can get up to much longer return periods obviously if you have a much larger set of events um, than that. So this is all yeah. from a little toy model? It's all from a toy. It's all from a toy. It produces rain and so forth. Um, how, how, yeah. how is the seeds? So, so you're talking about the frequency of the seeds that, and you calibrate that, but how do you calibrate the size of the seed? Or even, is there, is, are all seeds the same size? All the, there, all the seeds are the same size. size. They're all the same. Well, they have, a little, they have a little bit of a probability distribution taken from, you know, what we know about natural storms. It doesn't t tend to matter very much if you change that. So, yeah, they're, you know, we didn't actually think this would work. I have to be honest with you because not much for, so much for that reason, but because we observe most storms to form from pre-existing disturbances, not arise spontaneously. And it's only because we've done a lot of compare, and other folks have done a lot of comparison, most of which I'm not showing you here, of course, that we have any confidence in it at all. The remarkable thing is that the frequency of events, you get about the right distribution among the world oceans. You get the, I haven't shown you all, you get the nice seasonal cycle, it's beautiful. And you can even, you know, it even shows you that you'll have fewer events in the Atlantic during an El Nino year than a La Nina year in about the right proportion that we observe. So it's all these different tests, you know, in some sense, every one you can think of, of course, we'll think of more going forward that gives us any confidence in this. But so for example, if I were to make the seeds in order of magnitude larger, but the frequency in order of magnitude smaller, is that you, the model would behave similarly? Probably not with an order of magnitude, but factor two, yes. 
So what we do is we could up the seed strength by a factor two, and then we'd have to cut that calibration factor down. So a lot of it is just experimentation. Yeah. Your argument is that the, the distribution of hurricanes is determined much more by the conditions that promote growth than by the initial disturbance. That's what surprised us, and it yeah. surprised a lot of people. Exactly that. Exactly that. that the, the distribution of hurricanes is set much more by the conditions that promote growth than by the initial disturbance. So he throws in all these disturbances that go nowhere, that fizzle out, right? So, yeah. so they don't really care, you know, about the characteristics of the disturbance. It's that when you have conditions that promote that disturbance to grow, that's what matters. If that's set by the large scale yeah. conditions, not by the characteristics that we see. So if in, you know, for example, to take an example, ev everybody knows, this in quotes in my field, that most Atlantic hurricanes originate in a phenomenon that has nothing to do with hurricanes called an African easterly wave. You may have heard that. These come off of Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, regularly about every three days in the summertime. And many of the big hurricanes originate these. And you might the logic would be, and I should say, that this technique I'm describing, there's nothing about that. It doesn't, there's literally nothing about that. So if the interannual variability of Atlantic hurricanes were tied to the interannual variability of African easterly waves, we wouldn't be able to do interannual variability, but we can, all right? So there's an interesting piece of logic here. If you say, let's say that all hurricanes, this isn't true, but let's say all hurricanes originate out of pre-existing disturbances. Okay, that's a given. A logical conclusion might be, right, therefore, uh, if you change the distribution of those pre-hurricane disturbances, you'll change the distribution of the hurricanes. And that sounds right, and it actually isn't quite right logic. And it, you, there's a way you can get around that trap logically. That is, if supposing you eliminated African easterly ways, you might be tempted to say there wouldn't be any hurricanes. But that may not be true because there might be minute adjustments to the thermodynamic state. For example, hurricanes cool the ocean. Without hurricanes to cool the ocean, it warms up a little. That makes the atmosphere more conducive to hurricanes. It might go back to the same rate, for all we know. I mean, that's sort of a discovery that came out of this, that the seeding works at all is remarkable and was unexpected. And it teaches us something yeah, about I, the world. I, I, I miss this, I didn't understand this. Your toy model, where did you derive that from? From the Navier-Stokes equations, very much simplified. So it's, it's, a, it's a, a re-coordinated, uh, you re part of the Navier-Stokes equations. That's what that means. Just looked at it from yeah. the and simplified them, made certain approximations to them. Yes. So it's a deterministic model. It's not a statistical model. So, um, all right. So once you have these events, or any hurricane events, you can use them to drive well-known hydrodynamic surge models that are run on grids like this. We did a study for Manhattan, uh, which we published before Sandy, where we ran a large event set over uh, that was focused on New York, lower New York State. And we use those to drive surge models that are run on, we're actually seeing the lattice points for two different surge models. One is called slosh, it's just on a regular polar grid. The other is on an unstructured grid, it's called adcirc, it's the red dots you see sort of in the background there. It's a much more advanced, but much more computationally expensive model. And we produced this sort of estimate of surge periods at the Battery in the so southern tip of Manhattan where there happens to be a tide gauge, okay? And we published this, I can't remember when, but it was before Sandy, all right? Estimating return periods. This is the sort of thing you can do. And by that measure, Sandy, which had a surge of about 2.8 meters, would have been regarded as a 400 or 500 year event, all right? The kind of event you might, ex at least in terms of the surge, you might expect that frequency. Now once you have this, you can equally well apply it to a climate model as to a climate data set. And uh, I don't know, do I have a few more minutes or? Five. five minutes, all right. So, um, oh, until five, well I won't do that, but I'll, I'll go a few more minutes. Um, here's something that has nothing to do with global warming, it's just El Nino, and there are two different climate phenomena on this graph, I apologize, I'm really gonna only focus on El Nino. So this is just showing the number of events in the Atlantic 
observed in blue and by the simulated tracks for, two, for three different phases of the, sorry, two different phases of, um, of El Nino, that is El Nino and La Nina, and three different phases of a different phenomenon called the Atlantic Meridional Mode. And this is just to show that the synthetic technique knows that there's an El Nino, okay? It, it actually does fairly well. And this is the kind of thing that, you know, since I'm here and I'm talking to people that include economists, that I'd like to, to, to do with these synthetic events is to ask some simple questions like, can you use them to help, let's say, an insurance company decide whether it can take advantage of an El Nino forecast? Like right now, we're forecasting one of the biggest El Nino, maybe the biggest El Nino that will ever have occurred. At least some models suggest that. Which would suggest that we have a very quiet year in the Atlantic. So, supposing you're an insurance company, you've got properties all over the East Coast and Gulf Coast, and maybe you say, well, okay, it's gonna be a quiet year, so I'm gonna save some money and not buy as much reinsurance. I mean, it's one strategy, okay? So here's what we did with the cooperation of a large insurance company whose CEO helped me write the paper on this. Um, here is a kind of a very crude uh, distribution of properties across the US. Um, each of those dots is associated with a value. It's obviously in a conglomeration of points, but we're gonna use those and we're gonna run these synthetic events over those properties and use their property value together with a damage function to calculate how much damage, estimate how much damage these storms are gonna do. So now we had to sort of make this up, but this is after all more of a thought experiment than some, some real calculation we're doing. This is a, an estimate of the fraction of the property value loss as a function of wind speed, all right? So it has certain asymptotic properties we like. You don't get much damage at all below a threshold. If you exceed that threshold, things go up very quickly, and of course it has to saturate at one. You can't destroy more than 100% of the property. We used from the insurance, from an actual insurance company, curves like this, which show the um, annual premium on this axis versus, uh, this is for an insurance company, how much of the risk you retain, the so-called retention rate. The more you retain, the less premium you have to pay, obviously. And then this is um, something that insurance companies think about a lot, is their probability of ruin. And this is a calculation of their probability of ruin as a function of the annual premium, okay, that their insurance premium, which uses this curve to translate premium to risk. The reason that goes yeah. because they so here is just 10, we actually did 1,000 realizations. These are 10 realizations of the history of these hypothetical insurance companies um, that are exposed to hurricane risks. And what you see here is the capital in millions of US dollars. It's not allowed to go above 250. It's assumed that if it goes over 250, you're paying off you know, stockholders and so forth. It's very simple-minded. And if it goes below the solid line, you assume that the company has failed. That's just the assumptions of the game. So you can see that two of these 10 realizations fail after 40 to 80 years or so. And each time this takes a downward jog is a major loss, like a major hurricane. When it goes up, you have a few years where you're quiet, you're taking in premiums, but you're not paying anything out and so forth. So here's sort of the bottom line here. This is um, showing, this is a little confusing. This is a measure of the success or profitability of the firm. And we're gonna do two firms. One is going to have access to an El Nino forecast and knows perfectly, in this case, whether there'll be an El Nino or not. It doesn't know perfectly what storms might arise or not, but it knows it'll be an El Nino year. The other company pays no attention to the forecasts. Otherwise, they're identical. The accumulated revenue um, as a function of uh, time, uh, which is given on these graphs, uh, in millions of dollars, is the probability distribution is this graphed as a function of time from the start of the game. For the company that doesn't take the forecast into account, those are the solid curves versus the company that does. Those are the dash lines. And this is rigged, of course. The company with the knowledge has got to win in the end. We've rigged the game. The interesting thing is how long it takes because of the random volatility of hurricanes is such a big factor that even if you have perfect forecasts, you know, maybe after 10 years, 
you can say the probability distribution of the company that takes, makes use of a perfect El Nino forecast is separate from the one that did it, has separated. It's a, a bit of a subjective judgment. And after 100 years, they're clearly separate. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Why would the reinsurance companies adjust their rates? They would, and we assume that they wouldn't. So this is just asking a really fundamental question, is under ideal, really ideal conditions, is it worth it? Where only one guy knows. Where only one guy knows. So this is a really rigged thing. If this doesn't work, then the real world certainly wouldn't work in some sense. So this is taking one step further and, and supposing something which is actually much more realistic that about 40% of the El Nino forecasts are wrong. These are just binary forecasts in this game. El Nino or La Nina, that's it. 40% flawed forecasts, and this is after uh, 50 years. And so this is the perfect forecast, probability distribution. And here is the flawed forecast, and here is the control. So you say after 50 years in a realistic scenario, and that's, again, Michael, assuming that the reinsurer isn't reacting to the forecast. So it's really idealized. You know, is it worth it? Well, I suppose if you get the forecast for free and it costs you nothing to act on them, yes. But then you say, well, weigh this against the cost of reacting to the forecast. Is it worth it? In this case, I would say for a flawed forecast, probably not. So this is a, anyway, I didn't mean to try to get into any detailed conclusions that might or might not emerge from the study. But this is the kind of thing you can do when you have a lot of data and you have some confidence in it. Finally, let me say that we were going to apply this to global warming now, looking at a suite of global models, which are listed here for those who know what they mean uh, from the so-called CMIP-5 runs. Actually, in, in the meantime, we've upped this to eight models. It's a question of which models we can get the data we need from. And this is just sort of a global statistic. This is an indication of something called the power dissipation index, which is literally how much energy is dissipated by hurricanes globally, projected uh, out to the end of the century under the uh, emission scenario called RCP 8.5. The red is the multi-model mean and the shading is the scatter, shows you some me measure of the scatter among the models. So there's a fair bit of increasing hurricane power projected by this method over this period of time. And then when you get down to looking at individual places, it becomes very model dependent. So this is a study we did for New Haven and it shows the risk at the end of the 20th century in terms of return period of peak winds in New Haven in the blue dots and at the end of, the, of this century under the same emission scenario in red dots. That's a big one. And not all the models are that large, but that's a very large change. New England really gets it in the teeth. Not so much because of shifting thermodynamic conditions, the shifting tracks, the general circulation changing. Yeah. Does this take sea level rise into account? Well, the, it, the sea level rise won't affect the peak winds, but that's nevertheless a good question. We're going to go to surge finally. This is rain. Rain is something everybody agrees on. Hurricanes have to rain more as it gets hotter. It's just really, really simple physics, and it does. The return period of storm total rainfall is much larger in uh, the... Uh, and that's true almost across the board. And, and then we're going to take sea level rise into account now. This is our projections of sea level um, under different emission scenarios. You've all sort of seen these, I'm sure, in the order of a meter or so by the end of the century. Okay, so we're just going to build those into the surge model and look at, uh, and this is again a study we published before Sandy, um, projections of, hurricane, of surge risk at Manhattan at the Battery. Four different models showing you, you really do get quite different solutions. This is the current climate. The red and blue are the future climates. And you can see that the four different models we downscale give quite different answers, but they all show increased risk, mostly but not entirely because of sea level rise. Do that really affects the surges. How do they do for, so this is your model seeded by their conditions and they're downscaling it to the present. Oh, I'm very worried about the accuracy of their, yeah. Uh, no, but I just, I just try to figure out uh, the seeding rate. That, that's a good, the seeding rate is, is recalibrated 
for each model to give the mo to take into account the model's rendition of the 20th century climate. And that's, just, that's all the recalibration. That's the only recalibration. You wouldn't bias correctly at the temperatures. No. We don't do that. And we live with the fact that different models d demonstrably produce different answers, as they do in every arena of climate modeling. Right. Um, okay, and uh, I'm just going to skip that part. This is the last sort of thing I want to get across, is when you look at the change in the hurricanes at themselves without sea level, uh, in some sense, the changes that you get from global warming are very subtle. And this is an easy way to fool people. This is actually using that same set of that portfolio properties I talked about before. And we're looking at the probability density of damage. This is log of damage in US dollars, log base 10 of damages. And this is for a calculation done for the current climate in blue from a particular climate model called MIROC, and then for the future climate in green. Now, can you see the difference? It's not big, is it? It's very subtle. There's a little decline in the most probable damages, which are the weak storms, and a little bit of rise in the tail of the distribution, the big damages. Okay, so you look at that and say, eh, okay. Now, you you do the first moment, that is you multiply the probability density by the damage itself and you look at the curves and that's what you get. All right? So the area, literally the area under those curves is proportional to the total damage. Now you get this huge effect and the simple reason is, is that this little bump out here is occurring in the tail of the distribution of damages. You get a few more whoppers like this, it utterly dominates the change in the damage and that, in a nutshell is why we're worried about climate change and hurricanes. You wouldn't worry about it if you naively interpreted the left curve. And you worry about it a lot. I'm not saying this is right. I'm just trying to make the point that these little changes in the tail of the distribution, Mar Marty Weitzman likes to talk about this, changes in the distribution make a big difference. And when we run hundreds of thousands of events, we see storms that have never occurred in history. There's never been a hurricane in the Persian Gulf. Physics tells you you can. It's just very unlikely. Here's a storm that creates a four meter surge in Dubai. And the people who built Dubai had no idea that there was any hurricane risk at all. all right? That's another advantage. Physics tells you you can have a hurricane. So what? You've never had one. What does never mean? In practice, maybe 50 or 60 years in that region of, of records that you would be able to detect it. And the return period is probably 200 years. So of course you're not going to, it's not surprising you wouldn't see it. So we have black swans. And then we did the study some of you are familiar with for the risky business report. I think I'll skip that, but uh, looking ahead. So let me summarize. History is too short and imperfect to estimate hurricane risk. I hope I've made that point. Uh, better estimates can be made from paleotempestology and downscaling hurricane activity from either climatological data or if you want to go out the future global model output. Uh, hurricanes clearly vary with climate, that's for sure, and there is at least a risk that their threats will increase over the century. And I'll leave you with that. Happy to answer questions, of course. So the thing that I would just worry about, yeah. by kind of construction, the hurricanes do not feed back on the environment. So yes. It might be working very well for the small ones, but yeah. as you go towards bigger and bigger storms, you might expect that that doesn't work, right. but that's exactly the kind of hurricanes that you worry about. Yeah, so that's a very good question. Did everybody hear the question or not? I just don't want to know whether to repeat it. The question is whether the failure to allow these storms to feed back on their environment or just giving the environment could make a difference at large. I should have explained and forgot to that this is a cup, the hurricane model is coupled to the ocean, which is very important because hurricanes turn up cold water from deeper in the ocean and that reduces their intensity. That physics is in the model. But the broader point 
that if you had more hurricanes, they may change the climate, they may feed back in the climate, is not in this method, all right? So for example, yeah. already the assumption that a large hurricane still gets affected along by the mean flow, is that still the case? Yes, but you know, there is this so-called beta drift. Um, if you put a vortex in a stationary flow on a rotating planet, it will drift poleward and westward. That is in the model. Sure. So, uh, if you ask me what the weak points are, one thing is a weak point for almost any technique is the geometric size of storms. We don't know what controls that climate. We know that in the current climate, the overall di diameter of the storm is log almost perfectly log normally distributed, but we don't know why. And when we do the risk assessment to put the whole hurricane wind field into the statistics, we assume a log normal distribution, but we're uncomfortable with it because we don't know why it's there. There are other uncertainties. Yep. Can you show the number of years since the last major event? Uh, and, and so for your public interest, um, maybe they're more interested in uh, what the next one to, to make a landfall than, than the average return period of the average frequency. And so I wonder if you can make sort of a distribution of return period itself and make some sort of probabilistic. Well, that's right. So, I mean, the thing about a hurricane is, as far as we understand them, the fact that there has recently been one doesn't at all change the probability of having them in the future. That's probably not true for earthquakes, by the way, but for hurricanes it is. The, the reason I showed that graph is the important point, which I probably failed to make, is that the damaging storms are the ones that fall outside what you might call generational experience for a community. If a community has had a big Cat 5 hurricane in the last 10 years, you bet that most of its citizens are at least aware that that's a possibility. After 200 years of nothing, right, nobody remembers that. And it might sound like a trivial point, but there's some evidence that things like building codes begin to relax, people begin to relax, they go rebuild in places they shouldn't. So the reason for showing that graph which was actually suggested to me by an AP reporter who's a big hurricane sort of enthusiast, Seth Borenstein, was to show that there, by statistical accident, a few places that haven't had a hurricane in a long time. It doesn't mean that their probability is any different. What it does mean is the community is likely to be less conscious of the threat. That was the whole point of that. And maybe we should pay attention to those communities because maybe their building codes relaxed and. They're just not really prepared, but I have, uh, I have people working on that now, so that's work, in, whether it's really true that they're less prepared if they haven't had an event recently. Um, yeah, well. shear in the chips? Yes, okay. it's parameterized because it's an axisymmetric model, and we finally refined that parameterization to optimize the forecasts when we were running it in forecast mode. We never changed that going into risk mode. Yeah. So, so on, on the, the whole idea of uh, you know, adaptation versus mitigation, it, yeah. it seems to me, I mean, we, we don't yet know for sure that these models are able to accurately capture you know, how the costs are going to rise, but I, I could imagine some combination of policy and also just a well-informed insurance market sort of making the cost of you know, building near the beach in, on these coastal places more expensive. If, if there's sort of uh, an informed market response ahead of time, will that or could that reduce the costs to the point where at least this aspect of climate change wouldn't be a, a large concern? Uh, for what yeah, I'm glad you asked that question. I would even say that there's an awful lot that markets could do if they weren't so handicapped by regulation, even if the hurricane climate didn't change. So we have a situation you may be aware of in the United States where well, of course, insurance is heavily regulated and where you want to regulate it for at least for solvency. In fact, you know, there are caps put on premiums and they're put there largely for political reasons and largely because the people with expensive houses on the coast are usually more politically influential. I can tell you this is true from my experience in Massachusetts, all right? Yeah, in New Jersey. And so what happens is that we are, and I can explain this in detail, I don't have time to do it, we're massively underwriting risk in the United States, hurricane risk. Unfairly, I mean, not through markets. 
And I mean, I like to say this is one place where, you know, radically conservative economists and radical environmental coastal ecologists should be on the same page. Is if we didn't subsidize building on the coast so massively as we do, partially through insurance regulation, uh, we would have a lot less risk today. And I would have much more faith that insurance would, would uh, help not only deal with current risk, but at least you'd be untying it and allowing it to respond to the perception of future risk. So, can you, can you yeah. put a fine point on that? Yeah. How bad is it? Well, uh, let me tell you, try to answer that with a story. It's a true story. What happened in Massachusetts? You might be aware because I think you were there. Well, maybe it was before you got there. But um, the, 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 there's a whole industry of risk assessment, risk modeling, that took into account this phenomenon of what happens to hurricanes going to high latitudes and significantly up their modeling of risk on Cape Cod. This happened about 15 years ago or so. And then the next actors were the rating agencies who said to the insurance company, you don't have enough capital for this risk. So the companies went to the rate czar in Massachusetts, the insurance commissioner, asked for a rate increase and they said no. All right. So the next thing that happened was they all pulled out of Cape Cod. Within one year, most property owners got letters from the insurance company saying, we're not going to renew your policy with no explanation. Then there was a huge cry, okay, and the state came in to Cape Cod with their own insurance plan, ironically called the FAIR plan, mm -hmm. uh, which doesn't have enough capital, but which has a clause saying if they get clobbered, they can assess all the private property insurers in Massachusetts, period, over and out, in proportion to how much business they do in the state. So if you're a little mom and pop property insurance out in the Berkshires with no hurricane risk to speak of, you are liable for part of the state's risk on Cape Cod, and the rating agencies know that, so they pressure those companies who go to the state, and the state says, well, we're gonna let you, we're gonna raise the cap inland. So you can overcharge the relatively poor population inland so as to underwrite wealthy people on the coast. It's crazy. I mean, I'm not an economist, but this is crazy, right? Uh, it's, it's not small sums of money. I mean, I couldn't attach actual dollar values to it standing up here, but. We can talk about it. I think it's one of the most interesting, somewhat untold stories about a kind of corruption that's occurring widespread. Of course, it occurs in Florida as well. What did you say? Well, yes and no. Yes and no. Of course, it does in some. If there's a big earthquake, the first thing that happens is a disaster area, right? Yeah. 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 Yeah, and very few people do. Yeah, very few people do. I think it has to do with the frequency of damaging events and their spatial extent. Uh, the um, I mean, the more interesting question is why doesn't the state underwrite earthquakes? It does in other countries. Japan underwrites earthquakes. I don't, the last time I checked, private insurance generally didn't do earthquakes in Japan. It was uh, the state. And so um, people, you know, I don't really understand the earthquake problem nearly as well as I understand the hurricane, but it's an interesting question. Why, why is it so different in the earthquake sphere? There must be an answer. Maybe it's earth shaking or not, but there must be an answer. We don't have bad earthquakes. <laughs> here? Yeah. No, no, it's not something to worry about here, I don't think. Nor do you have hurricanes. It's well, a, I mean, in the US, we don't. Correlated damages is so great that the state knows it's important to do that. It could just be this thing that a hurricane is still relatively confined. It's natural. I don't know. I'm not sure if that's really true. If the extent of a hurricane is well, we have a ex fair experience of earthquakes in California, and I just don't know, you know, how did people whose properties were destroyed respond? Did they, by and large, have insurance? From what I hear, not. No, no, because the price part, the price insurance. It's too expensive, and they, do, where they get disaster relief, almost certainly. I just don't know how that all, the numbers all add up for that.
Thank you very much, Gary. Thank you, Michael. Yeah.